tonight. I need to clear something up right here at the beginning. I messed up this morning. And that is, I'm not preaching tonight. So, uh, I don't know why I said that. But I wasn't finished with the sermon I was preaching. And just naturally, I said, I'll finish tonight. But I'm not finished tonight. Scott's not finished tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's bow our heads and invite the presence of the Lord. Lord, thank you for your presence and help and service this morning. Thank you for your help throughout the day. We trust you now with this service tonight. We commit it to you and ask that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get our songbooks and join with Tim and Sam. Turn to 458. 458. I love the Lord this evening and uh, thank you for his many blessings. Just put it on record. I'm expecting God to answer some big prayers. And uh, I'm trusting Him. And I know He's able. So thankful for that tonight. And then today, uh, I'll not pray for it. But uh, today I thought, you know, I was talking to Brother Gardner yesterday, and he was just a few minutes from leaving this world. I thought, wow, just a few minutes ago I was talking to him. And then within a few minutes, he transverse worlds is in a whole other place. Talking to relatives, Jesus. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's a pretty, that's a neat transition, isn't it? And uh, I love the Lord this evening, and I plan on making heaven my home someday. 458.
that. Tonight we're going to the Lord in Prayer, and I believe we should uh, remember our nation and our country, our leaders that are leading us. And tomorrow's Memorial Day, and we want to remember the families of the heroes that have been lost, you know, fighting for our freedoms, fighting for what we have today, the opportunity that we have to gather in this house of worship. Many people across the world don't have this privilege, and we can thank the Lord and praise the Lord that we have this privilege. We have the privilege to openly worship and praise the Lord, and so I think we need to thank the Lord for that, but then remember our country. It's in a, it's in a state that we don't necessarily uh, like to see it in, but I, as you know, am an optimist, or I try to be, and I think the Lord can help us, amen? And He can help us in our nation. He can help us in our states. He can help us in our local governments. He can help us right here in uh, Boone County. And I believe the Lord is going to help us. So tonight as we pray together, and I'm going to ask Dad if he would lead us in prayer tonight, uh, that God would be with our nation and He would be with our leaders. And then we want to remember Ukraine. Tim also uh, reminds us every service to pray for Ukraine and they're still suffering over there. And we want to pray for the victims and the lives that are hurting in Ukraine. Let's pray for that need as well. There's many physical needs that are represented here tonight and many are not able to be here. We want to remember the Sankeys tonight. They're not able to be here tonight. And let's pray that God would be with Brother Sankey. He still has a collapsed lung and he's he was able to come this morning, and we praise the Lord for that, but it's, it's a real struggle for him to get out and do some things, especially church. And so let's pray that God would be with him and Sister Sankey as they are navigating these difficult waters. Let's remember the Marshall family, Gardner family. Let's pray for them. Let's remember Andrew and Caitlin uh, tonight, and let's remember that need and those that are affected by that. We want to remember Shamika, as the Winkler Sister Winkler mentioned this morning. Let's pray that God would be with Shamika, maybe being transferred to a different location. And let's pray that God would be with uh, that request. Let's remember Ralph Wilmhoff. He was admitted to the hospital, but seems to be doing a little bit better, Pastor Stutler said. And so let's thank the Lord for that, but let's continue to remember him as he's there in the hospital needing uh, physical touch tonight. And then let's remember uh, the needs that were not mentioned, that you have on your heart. And let's pray that God would be with those needs. I'm thinking of Emerson Brooks, and let's pray for that need. Let's remember Stanley's great-grandson tonight as he is battling with a heart issue. Let's pray that God would be with us, that he would be with us with the physical needs that we have, but also the spiritual needs that are represented here. And let's pray that God would help us in this time. Are there any other spoken requests that I might be missing? Yes, Jennifer. I know some of the Judaism people that I saw at the female this afternoon, but Kylie Janowski, her mom, went to the hospital with COVID, and now she has pneumonia and her lungs, and this is looking good. She just really needs to touch her. Yes, there was a student's mom that uh, uh, had COVID, diagnosed with COVID, and went to the hospital, and then they found that she had uh, pneumonia in both lungs, and she was coughing. Up blood and it was very and not looking good at all and so we want to pray that God would be with the Janowski family as we pray tonight. Are there any others? Yes, but then. Okay, let's remember that he tonight, Merle Reynolds tonight. Let's pray for him. I'm sure there are many unspoken requests. Yes, all over the audience. God knows, He hears, He can answer, and we can trust Him with those needs. And I believe it with all my heart. And let's go to the God in heaven who is able to meet our needs tonight as we pray. Let's stand as we pray. Oh, God. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the song you have been together for Oh, Lord, we're trusting you. Amen. 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 Oh God, we bow and we 
Amen. I want us to sing the chorus of My Faith Still Holds. I don't know what number that is. It's in the chorus book if you need it. Let's sing it. My faith still holds unto the Christ of Calvary. Oh, blessed Christ, all ages clap for me. to the doctor, my oncologist, for my five-year update uh, for my cancer, and said everything's clear, cancer-free, so thank you for that, thank you that God gave me another uh, cancer-free year, and now to go back the next year, uh, pretty much probably for quite a while, go back for uh, at 
least on a yearly visit. So we're thankful to be here and uh, glad to be here. We thought we'd just share a quick update of how our life has changed over the last 10 months and we wanted to just include some of our favorites that we've enjoyed. Any of you that have um, been in a new culture for any period of time know there's just a lot to love and a lot to learn about a new place and a few of our favorites that we listed. Uh, the first one that came to mind is kind of random but it's shopping malls. And I don't quite know how to describe it to you. One of the great things about living in Honduras is when I was a teen, the fun thing to do was go hang out at the mall on Friday night. And that is no longer really a thing. If you go to the <laughs> mall, they're just kind of dead and dying here. But if you take the malls when I was a teenager and multiply that about by 100, you get what a mall in Honduras is like. It's where everybody goes. It's where all the fun happens. And it's just a super fun thing. Um, of course, we have the food. My two favorites I had to put down. I'm going to make um, Ellie really hungry back there. But carne asada and baleadas, they just, it doesn't get any better than that. Another thing I love about living in Honduras is just the outdoor living because it's a warm climate. I've never lived in a warm climate like that before. So you go to restaurants, you go to just about anywhere. You know, your porch is as much your living room as somewhere else because it's a warm climate. So as long as there's a little roof over it, you can live outside as well as you can live inside. And that's just a really, it's just a fun, different way of life. And then, of course, Hunter and Coffee. Yes, Hunter and Coffee is probably, no, it is the best. Um, when we come back here, we really miss our Hunter and Coffee, or we just bring some with us and have it here. Uh, some of the things I would have think that I really appreciate about the Hunter and culture, um, this can probably have its negatives and its positives, but it's a very glow, go with the flow atmosphere. Um, you can kind of just do it as you do it, and time isn't as important as here. It's still important, but not quite as important. You can start church a few minutes late, no one really cares. You can come in a little bit late, no one really cares, really like that. Um, probably the first thing I notice when I step off the airplane in Honduras is just the overall atmosphere of friendliness from the people. And so I'm not saying the U.S. isn't friendly, I'm not dissing our culture at all. We tend to not be quite as openly friendly as the culture there would be. Um, That's something I've always appreciated about the culture of Honduras. Uh, also, just a random, these are just no order, but just kind of random things we thought of today as we were thinking through this. Um, one interesting thing that I like about Honduras is that almost every day it gets dark around 6 o'clock. So you kind of have your evening, it's dark. Uh, we were sitting in Dorks' house the first night we were back, and I was like, it is 8 o'clock, and it's still light outside. What is this? And then it kept going. I was like, Pastor, it's 9.30, it's still light outside. What in the world? And so uh, that's something we really um, have learned to love um, there in Honduras. Another thing that's very awesome is you can get kind of pretty much any service work job. Um, for instance, we had a refrigerator repairman come and uh, we went to the dentist. You can get it done for half the price you can in the U.S. and probably a little bit more thorough of a job than maybe you would get here in the U.S. Um, great job. That's something that I have learned to love about Honduras. It's not to say there aren't some things to get used to. Any culture is going to be a little different. And I would say one of the things that I will probably be the thing I've struggled with the most is the water instability and the electricity instability. So right now we live in the city and things are a little, little better and a little different. But when we were in language school, we were living up in the mountains. And so water was a little bit more hit and miss. And that just got a little old real fast, I'll be honest. We had a period of time where, over quite an extended period of time, where you just never knew when the water was going to come on. I think the, ma the max we ever went was like three days without water. So it wasn't that bad. But it was just, you just I just hated coming home and not knowing if there was going to be water coming out of the sink or not. Um, and then the electricity, because, and even the Hondurans will tell you, this year has just been worse for some reason. I don't know why. You know, you're right in the middle of doing something and your electricity goes off, and you know it's gone for the rest of the day. And it's like, well. Every time she plugs in the crock pot. <laughs> Every time, gone. yes. <laughs> Not using the crock pot anymore. Um, so that's been something that has just been something to get used to. And then, of course, just missing friends and family and feeling like, you know, there's just not the people that you're used to saying, hey, let's go get a coffee or let's go hang out because it's just a different culture and a different way of connecting with people. Yes, we always miss our friends and family. Um, one of the big things I would say right off the bat would be uh, different for me going into this culture, especially when we moved to Tegucigalpa, Golf, which is the capital city. And Tegucigalpa Golf, the streets are just not organized. Um, there's other cities like San Peter Sula, where Ellie is from, uh, is just beautifully organized. But in Tegucigalpa, Golf, it's in the mountain, just through and through, just the curves and stuff. And the traffic there is um, somewhat challenging at times. Now, I've learned to love the traffic. And actually, when I got out here, um, on my first days back this time, on 471, there was an accident, and everyone was having to get over. And I got to thinking, how do I do this in the U.S.? Because in Honduras, I just put the window down, put my hand out, and that person behind me, respects it, stops, and I get over it. And it's really, really simple, it's easy. Um, so that's one thing that I found to be challenging, but also I'm learning to love it. 
Um, also, I would say the uh, difference in, in time awareness is something that we've, we've been adjusting to. So my, um, well, somebody was coming to repair something in our house, and they, they used the word ahorita, which I thought meant like right now. They're coming exactly now. And someone can help me <laughs> explain this to me later, because apparently I did not understand that. And so right now meant a couple hours later. And um, whatever, uh, I must have misunderstood something in, in the conversation. But I was sitting on my phone, and I was doing some things. And all of a sudden, I was like, wait a minute. I've been here for an hour waiting for this guy. I've been wasting my time. Also, I think the biggest thing that we've noticed um, challenge in a different country. I went into language school with kind of optimism because I thought that I knew, had a baseline knowledge of Spanish, and it would just come, it would come naturally, it would come faster. Um, but I found out that actually uh, another language is a very huge, massive thing. And so while we have spent eight, seven months in language school, uh, we have plenty to learn, plenty to go. Um, we are probably going to look at going back into language school this fall or summer, I'm not sure which, just online classes with our original teachers. And I kind of dread that because then they're going to learn how we've degressed and how we progress. I'm not sure. It might be a little challenging to, uh, to do that. But um, God has really helped us. So prayer, I kind of pray almost every day while I'm there is that God will just help, help my Spanish today because, my goodness, I can't do it without you. And uh, it's kind of giving me a, a witness opportunity because I pretty much tell everybody who tells me you have good Spanish there, I say, well, thank, thankful for good teachers and thankful to God because I pray every day for my Spanish to, to improve. And that being said, we are able to start have started preaching and teaching in Spanish a little bit. Um, my sermons are usually more scripted and read um, with some uh, feedback, some output of my own, from my own mind, but at this point, a little bit scared to uh, get to preaching and talking like this. Um, if I had this little time to prepare for this in Spanish, I'd be freaking out right now. But <laughs> God has really, really, really helped, and sometimes you know, it's just when you get in the pulpit, God just gives you the language, the language. And uh, um, there's one lady that comes to our church that <clears throat> she speaks, she knows English, she doesn't really speak it much. And uh, one time I got caught in a little spot, and she translated it right away, and you. Keep flowing. So um, God has really helped. And so this couple Sundays ago, started preaching about every other week. I think it was a couple, three Sundays ago. God really helped me preach a sermon on uh, keeping your eyes or your focus on Christ. And it has, I've preached it several times in English before, and it's always been one of my favorite sermons to preach in English. So it's cool to be able to preach it in Spanish the next time. And uh, I could tell it really connected with the people, and I was hoping that it would, God would use it in their lives. So after I got done, Eric took over, Pastor Eric took over, and he uh, began going through different things, and he actually announced some things. But really, just the, the service had ended, and he had dismissed everybody, and a lady came forward, and she said, I want to pray. And uh, she had come to church several several different times, several years maybe, and had really given her heart to God. It was just awesome to uh, be able to pray with her and watch her. She wept and really, really uh, took the time to really get through spiritually. She's looking at hopefully getting discipled now and wanting to get baptized here in the future. So we're thankful for those kind of opportunities that God is giving us. So we look towards the future. We will be hopefully installed in our church at the end of July. I'm not sure. I can't remember the exact date. Eric and I planned it, but now I forgot the date. So um, at the end of July sometime, we'll be installed as pastors there. Kind of our thought and dream for the church is to grow the church uh, numerically, grow the church also spiritually. We'd love to start some Bible studies with the church to kind of give them a baseline knowledge of the Bible. Um, let's say several people there because of lack of education can't read the Bible. So they have to listen to the Bible, and technology isn't quite as advanced, but for these people that are impoverished, so they don't have quite the technology we would have to be able to listen to the Bible. So it's really an opportunity and a task to be able to present the Bible to them. I'd love to just give them, kind of give them an overview of the Bible, give them a baseline knowledge of the Bible, and then uh, really start discipling people as well. I'd love to see the church grow, not just numerically, but spiritually, deep in their hearts uh, for God. We're praying for revival in our churches and praying that God really moves and works we're looking forward to great things, and we're really thankful for what God has done so far. We're looking forward to the future. Another big thing that we're focusing on is, like Jeremy kind of alluded to already, is the education. And um, I just can't tell you how grateful it makes you for all of the Bible training you've had when you are around people that would just give anything to have more training in the Bible. And so we would just love to work uh, with our church people for education. A lot of the kids there have had absolutely no schooling, and so that's kind of our big goal. The Honduran school year starts in February. So by this February, we have a lot of things that would like to get the ball rolling for. Most of the kids in our church don't, they were never registered. 
And so they don't even, they don't have birth certificates, but they weren't even registered as born. And so that's a process, if you can imagine, all the Spanish paperwork that's involved with that, getting their birth certificates and getting them in, um, enrolled in school. And then they're severely behind as well. And so we're looking to start an after school program for them. The Honduran school day is very short. It only goes till about 12 o'clock and they have recess and lunch in there as well. So there's a lot of um, extra space where the kids are bored and would love to have something to do. So we're excited about starting an after school program for them and just helping make them advance hopefully a little more rapidly than if they're just going to the school. Um, just a story that kind of goes along with this, maybe it's not an update, but I know there's a lot of kids in here, and this story when I heard it kind of just strengthened my faith, and so I thought some of the kids would want to hear this, but um, one of the privileges of being there is just meeting awesome people who have such a deep walk with Christ, and just, um, it's just an awesome privilege, and sometimes when you're struggling with a new language, you can think, see like, oh, I'm just not doing as well as I wanted to do, but then ending a conversation and just realizing, wow, I never would have met this person of faith, or I never would have gotten to witness how God has worked in their life if I hadn't been able to talk to them. And um, one of the people that we're excited, we're going to do a BBS hopefully in Nicaragua this summer. And one of the pastors there just has an incredible story where he wanted to, um, or he was working in a factory and him and some of the factory workers just said, hey, do you wanna to get together after work and start studying the Bible? And literally had no church, no nothing, no knowledge of anything to do with Christ. And so they started coming together after work just to study the Bible. And they got together and they opened up the Bible. And this is one of our HIM pastors, so it's a, it's a pretty reliable story. But they opened up the Bible and the Bible started glowing golden for them. And they would turn the pages and God would lead them. And they would study it together and he would lead them through themes every night when they'd get together. And he would lead them through things like salvation and holiness and even such a very specific issues that he would lead them through. And eventually through a connection, they were able to connect with HIM and join, um, join that connection. But they said there really wasn't a whole lot that needed to change or be different because they already had such a strong foundation in that area where there wasn't a lot of uh, options available to them. God was so faithful to just provide what they needed in that moment. Um, but we just love to be able to work with the people in our area and just provide them more, more biblical training so that way they can grow in their relationship with God and just grow closer to Him. I'd like to thank you so much for your support uh, throughout the stuff in years <laughs> the year we have been missionaries. Thank you so much for your financial and for your prayer support. We feel it. We uh, see it. Uh, your faithful support. Thank you for that. We have great plans. This summer is going to be kind of booked. We have BBSs. We have different countries we're going to, hopefully Guatemala and Nicaragua, doing different BBSs. And uh, we're really looking forward to a full-packed summer. We have our first intern this summer kind of pairing with us and the Coons. So you can pray for us for that. Just a couple of prayer requests, um, and like Jeremy said, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. I said this this year going to IHC was a little overwhelming, honestly, just walking around and hardly being able to get from one side of the room to the other without people telling us that they're praying for us monthly, bi-weekly, weekly, some people even daily, and that's just something we don't take for granted. You can't imagine just what that means to have that kind of a support, prayer support behind us. But just pray for us as we're installed as pastors, that God would lead us and guide us. Um, and he would just give us a special empowering that he would help give us wisdom as we plan for our BBSs this summer and that um, souls would be saved and just a deeper spiritual walk in our church people's lives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that update. And I was thinking as they were talking, I, I really can't imagine, I cannot imagine uh, having all the thoughts that would come to me that I interpret and process in English, having them processed in two languages. I really can't even imagine. I was talking to Ellie this morning about going to uh, Mexico and preaching with an interpreter. The only time I've done it, I said, I really kind of liked it from this standpoint. It gave me a pause to think about what I was going to say next. <laughs> But, uh, but this idea that I'm going to take these thoughts that are in my mind and I'm going to think of them in English and I'm going to think of them in another language, we need to pray that God will, will enable uh, Jeremy and Esther as they go through that very process to establish that. And uh, i tell you what I think we ought to do. I'm not going to pass the plates for an offering. I'm just going to ask you for a vote. How many of you would be in favor of giving them $500 tonight? Would you, would you just raise your hand? I'm not asking it from you. I'm saying from the church. All right? All right. Good. All right. I don't think, I don't know if Rick can hear me back there, but maybe he can just go ahead. Our missions treasure is gone. But is that okay with the ladies? All right. So don't leave without your check. All right. All right. All right. 
thank you so much, so much for that update. Let me just give you a couple of announcements. Don't forget to parade in the morning. You've got to be there no later than 930. I would recommend you get there a little bit earlier than that because they do shut down the street and uh, you'll have to come around the back way. Boone County High School up on 18. Is it 18? Yes. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Plan to be there. And we're going to, uh, we've got a lot of candy out there. Isn't that great? <laughs> if you didn't bring yours, don't buy it today. But but tomorrow morning, early, go get some and bring it with you. All right? So, uh, all right. And we're going to we're gonna spread that around and pass out. And let's pray that God would help somebody to know about our church. You know, Sherilyn has uh, yard sales every once in a while. And, and uh, Krista Wilmhoff had a bunch of stuff from a house she was selling that just needed to be gotten lit up and sold. So they had a big, big yard sale out here the other day. And uh, of course, this is a busy, busy highway, busy street now. And uh, we were absolutely amazed at how many people drove by and said, I've seen this church for years. And I've always wanted to stop by or we come every year. The, our favorite thing to do at Christmas time is to come to the drive through Christmas program here. And, and just on and on and on. And uh, that happened multiple, multiple times. Well, part of the reason we go right in the parade is just to say, hey, there's a church out there somewhere, sometime. God's going to remind somebody, oh, that's the church that passes out candy. I need some. I need help. And I'm going to see. Well, let's pray that that happens tomorrow. So don't forget that. The uh, father and son, men, boy, camp out is this Friday night and Saturday. Is that right? What's the date of that? June? Second, Second and third. All right. And it looks like the, the uh, weather's going to be good. So don't don't forget that. Also, <clears throat> the uh, the camp, youth camp's coming up. I know IHYC is coming up. It's in the bulletin. Uh, Pilgrim Youth is coming up. A lot of our kids have gone there for years, so that's coming up. Don't forget, if you have questions, or uh, feel free to see what Scott about that. And don't forget the VBS. Sherilyn and Andy will be back late tonight and be there for the, the parade in the morning. But uh, it, we're, we're going to need a lot of volunteers, so if you can help, be sure to see Sherilyn. And uh, she'll be getting that organized very soon. Such a joy to have Anthony and Ruth to sing for us tonight. The Lord bless them as they minister to us. And then uh, Scott's going to bring the message. Let's keep our hearts open and allow God to speak to us tonight. Gave up on finding 
that strong and lasting love. I tasted all the things that sin could think to offer me, but today I feast on manna from above. He is here, hallelujah. He is here, amen. He is here, holy, holy. I will bless his name again. He and closely hear him calling out your name he is here you can touch him you will never be the same he is here you can touch him you will never be the same you will never be the same thank you anthony and ruth ruth for your ministry and that beautiful song tonight thank you jeremy and esther for that update that was uplifting and encouraging and uh, if you're not praying for them and supporting them, think about doing it. Amen. Should have heard a really loud amen back there. <laughs> I'm kidding. But yes, thank you so much for sharing. And let's continue to pray for Jeremy and Esther as they're ministering in Honduras, that God would be with them and give them strength and grace. I believe they're doing a great work. And let's lift them up in prayer and support. Would you stand tonight, shake hands with somebody, not on your row, tell them that they look good. All right, you can be seated. Woke up a little bit, sat for a while, and now you can... I think Brother Stetler should be preaching, honestly. I told him that he could come do this, and he had a message written, prepared, ready to go. But I'm here, so that's okay. As you know, today is Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost is a time that we celebrate every year. And one reason that we celebrate this event is because of the transformative power that Christ made in the disciples' hearts and lives, but also the believers during that time. We celebrate this time also because of the reality that Pentecost can change our hearts and our lives. The work of Pentecost in your heart and in your life will allow the Holy Spirit to have full and total access to your lives. And if you were to take a little time and study Pentecost a little bit, you would find that Pentecost was a feast and still is a feast celebrated in the Jewish tradition. It's celebrated every year, and Pentecost literally means 50th. Pentecost was traditionally held 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. And if you were to study Leviticus chapter 23, that's the chapter that we find, the list, the outline of feast, you would notice that there is first the Passover feast, and that gives a glimpse of Christ's death as a lamb. Then comes a little later the feast of first fruits, and that gives a glimpse of his resurrection. And then 50 days later, we come to the feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost represents the power of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus sent to us on that day in 
Acts on, in Acts chapter 2, we find where the Bible talks about Pentecost, and that's where we find this third feast of Pentecost. And so for our time this evening, I would like us to focus on the reality of what Pentecost means to us and what it can do for us in our hearts and in our lives. So if you have your Bibles with you, I would ask you to turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and if you'll keep your Bibles open, we'll be looking at a few different passages this evening. But first, we're going to be looking at John chapter 17. We'll begin our reading with verse number 8. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little context of this passage. In this chapter, God the Son is talking to God the Father. This is an outstanding passage of Scripture. This is an awesome glimpse of Jesus communing with His Father. And we, over 2,000 years later, are privileged to be sitting here and listening to the wonderful words that Jesus is speaking to His Father. Some people say that this is the holy of holies of prayers recorded in Scripture. And so I would encourage you this week, if you have some time, maybe in your devotions, to take this chapter, John chapter 17, and sit down when you have a minute and read it. And let it sink in. Let it infiltrate your life and see the impact that this passage is talking about. It's Jesus communing with his Father. But for our study tonight, I would like to begin with verse number 8. It reads... For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, all and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou hast given me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. First tonight, I would like us to consider the prerequisites of Pentecost. The prerequisites to Pentecost. A few moments ago, I just read John chapter 17, verses 8 through 12, and Jesus was praying for his disciples. Jesus knew his time on this earth was short, he knew that he was no longer going to have the personal face-to-face -face interaction and influence with his disciples. And in verse 8, he says that this, the disciples received the words that he has spoken to them, and they believed what he taught them. But Jesus, as you look in verse 11, is still concerned that they would stumble. You ask, why, why is that? And he, that is because he is pleading with his Father to keep them steady. He says, Holy Father, keep them through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. The first prerequisite that you must have before you can fully experience Pentecost is that you must believe the words of that Jesus has spoken. Jesus said that he had given the disciples the words that the Father had told him to say, and the disciples received him. Did you see that? Verse number 8. Friends, you will never get anywhere spiritually if you cannot believe the words that Jesus has spoken. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot seek 
the kingdom of God. See the kingdom of God. Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Do you believe the words that Jesus has spoken? A prerequisite to Pentecost is to believe the words of Christ. There are many words found in this book, and I just gave you a few little words, a few little quotes here and there throughout the Bible, but there's a whole canon of Scripture that you have to believe. The second prerequisite to Pentecost is that you must be not, you must not be of this world. If you look with me, Verse number 14, read, it reads that I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Friends, if you want the reality of what I'm talking about tonight, Pentecost, in your heart and in your life, you must not be of this world. Worldliness is any thought attitude, action, goal, or behavior that is contrary to the Word of God. What are you thinking about? Is it contrary to this book? How are your attitudes toward things? Is it something you need to work on? There's lots of times in our lives where our attitudes can get kind of wonky, maybe. If I can use that word. You might be playing disc golf, as I like to play. And uh, sometimes I miss a few putts here and there. And that can be a little frustrating. And so, you know, you can get frustrated. But there's others watching. How are your attitudes when things are getting rough and tough? We'll leave it there. What about your actions? The things that you are doing? Are the actions or activities that you're participating in contrary to what Scripture says? We have the whole Bible here. It outlines what we're supposed to do. It outlines what we're not supposed to do. Are you aligning to it is the question. What are your goals? Oh, we as people, humans, have goals. At least I do. I have lots of goals. But are my goals, are they aligned to what God has for me in my life? That can put us back a little bit. I have a goal that I want to accomplish, but God says, not now, not now. You, that's not for you. That's for someone else, maybe. And that, it doesn't even have to be sinful. It could be an aspiration that's God-honoring. What about your goals? Are they contrary to Scripture? Are they God-approved? Friends, any thought, attitude, action, goal, behavior that is contrary to the word of God or what he wants in your life is worldliness. Living a worldly lifestyle will not only not get you in the line for Pentecost, but it will detract from that. A prerequisite to Pentecost is not being of the world. The third prerequisite to Pentecost that I notice in this chapter is that you must be willing to be sent out as a witness. Verse 18 says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Are you willing to be a billboard for Christ? Who's, who all seen billboards on the highway? Everybody here should raise their hand. We've seen big billboards. We see small billboards. We see bench ads. In Cincinnati, they have bench ads. And I think they're the funnest, coolest thing ever. Only because there's a bench ad in Cincinnati that says, has two googly little eyes, and it says, see, you looked. It gets you every time. Because if you didn't look, it never got you. But if you looked, it got you. And then in smaller font, it says, bench ads work. Okay, well, that's debatable. But it's, it's a pretty good one. Advertising is a big deal. And I really didn't realize how big of a deal advertising really is in the United States until I looked this up and I was rather shocked at how much money people put into just billboard 
advertising. A study conducted in 2015 found the industry average for annual revenue, all right, sit down, buckle your seat belts, 3.69 billion, that's with a B, dollars. That's the amount of revenue that people spend on billboards. Drive down the highway, you see a billboard. Why do they do that? It's just a tool to grab your and my attention so that they can get their product or whatever they are advertising to sell. One thing is true for advertising, and that is that they try to make themselves look as good as possible. And I might add, there's a few companies that we should not be supporting right now because of their rather woke uh, advertising that has been going on. And that's not even here, so I better move on quickly. But advertising is key. And what our companies in the United States are advertising, you need to watch it because you shouldn't be supporting some of the advertising that is going on, supporting the advertising or the companies. That's free. We'll move on quickly. But they try to make themselves look as good as possible. Why? They're not going to put up something that looks terrible because they want the product that they're producing to sell. How are we as Christians doing at advertising for Christ? You know, you're a walking billboard. You're a walking billboard. When you're at Kroger and the lady in front of you is taking way too long, how are you treating her? Maybe it's a man. How are you treating him? Or maybe this one really will get me. You're at McDonald's and you want an ice cream cone. You get up to the line and you say, I would like an ice cream cone. And they say, the ice cream machine is broken. <laughs> oh, that will bless me. Not. Friends, we're to be examples wherever we're at. We are to be a witness, and a prerequisite to Pentecost is being willing to be sent out into this sin darkened world. We are to be witnesses for Christ. That means we don't stick our heads in the sand and hope that nobody talks to us and hope that nobody says anything weird so we don't have to try to talk to them. No, we're a light. We're a testimony, and at times that's going to be a little awkward, and that means we as Christians don't do some things that other people do. Why? Because we're a witness for Christ, and if, you wanna, if you're going to be a witness for Christ and you're going to be sent out into this world, that is a prerequisite to Pentecost. So we've noticed tonight three prerequisites. In college lingo, we just call it prereqs. One is you must believe the words that Jesus has spoken. Two, you must not be of this world. And three, you must be willing to be sent out as a witness. Secondly, tonight, we've considered the prerequisites. Secondly, tonight, I would like for us to consider the person of Pentecost. If you have your Bibles open, turn with me to Acts, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start our reading with verse number 5. It says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The person of Pentecost, the scripture tells us, is the Holy Ghost. Or you could call him the Holy Spirit. Many of us here tonight understand who the Holy Spirit is. He is the third person of the Trinity. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus here in Acts chapter 1 is saying that he is going to send them the Holy Spirit. Throughout the Bible, God's Spirit has empowered God's people to live righteously and to minister to others. And Scripture often portrays excuse me, this empowerment in dramatic ways. Or in miracles. In other times, the Spirit simply empowers God's people. And this is what I want us to understand tonight. 
The Spirit simply empowers God's people to live their daily lives as a Christian ought to live. The person of Pentecost empowers us to live as we ought to live and to conduct our lives in ways that we ought to live. As we go through life, different challenges come into our lives. It may be physical challenges, it may be financial challenges, it may be work challenges, but whatever the challenge that you are facing, the person of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, was given to us to help guide and direct our lives. He was given to us so that we may become more like Christ. Situations come into our lives where we may not act like we should. And the Spirit is there to nudge us and to guide us and to help us align to what He wants us to be. The person of Pentecost is there to remind us who we are in Christ. He helps us improve where we need to improve. But not only does the person of Pentecost empower us to be faithful Christians... But the person of Pentecost dwells in our hearts. If you look with me at John, back at John chapter 14, verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world can not receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth within you, and shall be in you. This evening, the person of Pentecost can dwell in you. But there's a requirement. And that requirement is in verse 15. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And to allow the person of Pentecost to take residence in your heart, to dwell within you, you must be committed and you must be obedient to the commandments found in the word of God. You must him, allow him to have full control over your actions, over your lifestyles, over your job, over your family, your friends. Why? Because Christ demands our all. If he's going to dwell in your heart, you must give him Everything. Matthew 16, 24 says, He commands us to take up our cross and to follow Him. Friends, to allow the person of Pentecost to dwell within your heart, you must keep His commandments. We've studied the person of Pentecost who empowers us to live the Christian life, who dwells in our hearts, then third tonight, the Holy Spirit, the person of Pentecost, provides permanent access to his presence if you believe. If you remember back in the Old Testament times, the priest would enter the Holy of Holies, and he was able to do this once per year. He would go through a rigorous routine. He would even wear something around his ankle just in case something were to happen. Because he was the only one able to go in. This was a special time and he was able to commune with God and have the awesome responsibility to respect the privilege and to feel the powerful presence of the Lord. There were times where the Lord showed himself to other people besides the high priest. But they had to offer sacrifices. They had to go to the temple to feel the presence of the Lord. They had to have a special time and place in the old dispensation. But now, because of the reality of Acts chapter 2, and where God gave us the Holy Spirit and the comforter that He has given us, and because of the reality of His death and resurrection on the, cry, or on the cross, we can sense and feel the presence of the Lord wherever we go. We are His temple. You may be in your car worshiping God as you're listening to music. You may be washing dishes, moms or dads, and you can feel the presence of the Lord near. You may be digging ditches or sitting at your desk, but the reality 
of it all is the person of Pentecost who is dwelling in your heart can meet you where you are at. In the old dispensation, you had to come to him. You had to go to the, the temple. You had to make sacrifices. But now we can partake in the supernatural phenomenon where we're able to commune with the God of heaven who created the world, who spun the world into existence and we are able to commune with him on a personal level and feel his presence. The person of Pentecost gives us the opportunity to avail ourselves of his awesome presence. And we have access to the throne room of heaven. Tonight we've looked at the prerequisites to Pentecost. We've looked at the person of Pentecost. And ten, lastly tonight, we're going to look about the power of Pentecost. The power of Pentecost. A wise man said, and I quote, We are not going to move this world by criticism of it, nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. That made me stop when I read that a minute. I'm going to read it one more time because I think it's spot on. We are not going to move this world by criticism of it, nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of the lives ignited by the Spirit of God. Think about this. The early church did not have the advantages that we have today. They did not have the buildings that we have they may have had house churches. We don't exactly know. Later they did build churches. But when they started, they did not have the advantages that we have. We, they didn't have the buildings. They didn't have the financial uh, resources that we would have. They did not have the influence in the government that we might would have today. They didn't have the social status. But they did what they did and won the multitudes of people to Christ out of a willing, obedient heart that was empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were ignited by the Spirit of God. And honestly, something that really concerns me as a church is that we have the advantages. We're set up and ready to go. We're ready to see the harvest brought in. But instead of multitudes being one to Christ, and I'm not totally blaming the church because God moves in different ways in different times, and I understand that. But I see a lot of division within the, the church. I see a lot of nervous people about moving forward. I see a lot of lack of mission, lack of vision. I'm not, totally, I'm not talking about Burlington. I'm talking as the church broadly. Understand. But friends, if we're going to change this world and spread the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth that this passage is telling us to do, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. We're going to have to spend a little extra money. We're going to have to have a little vision. We're going to have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're going to have to take the advantages that we have, the buildings, the money, the vision, the missions that we have, and we're going to have to use that so that we, as Christians, who are ignited by the Spirit of God, can reap the harvest. Speaking to a large audience, D.L. Moody held up a glass and asked, How can I get the air out of this glass? One man shouted, Suck it out with a pump. Interesting. Moody replied, That would create a vacuum and shatter the glass. After numerous other suggestions, Moody smiled, picked up a pitcher of water, and filled the glass. There, he said, all the air is now removed. He then went on to explain that the victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by just sucking out sin here and there, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And friends, if we're going to see the results that we want to see 
in our churches, in our schools, in our families, at the workplace, or wherever you find yourself, you're going to have to get the sin out of your life and be empowered by the Holy Spirit. As Moody stated well, you cannot have victory in the Christian life by just taking, a care, by just taking care of a few sins here and there and brushing the rest underneath the rug. No, you're going to have to get rid of it all and be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Once you become empowered, you will become a witness for Christ. Remember, a prerequisite is that you have to be willing. But once you're empowered, you are now a witness. You are now a witness for Christ. You will be able to fulfill the mission that Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is talking about. You will be a witness for Him. You will have the power of the Holy Ghost in your heart. Friends, the power of the Holy Spirit can transform your life. You will have love. You will have joy. You will have peace. You will have long-suffering. You will have gentleness. You will have goodness. You will have faith. You will have meekness. You will have temperance. Where did I get those? It's the fruit of the Spirit. These are attributes of a person that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you may not exhibit those perfectly right now. And that's okay, but when, once you're empowered by the Holy Spirit and you have those attributes in your life, God will help you and you will build on those attributes and you will become more like Him and you will grow in peace and you will grow in gentleness and you will grow in goodness. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Pentecost represents the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers. So tonight I ask, have you been empowered by the Spirit? Do you know the person of Pentecost? He equips you as a Christian. He can dwell in your heart. His, per his presence is permanent. Do you have the prerequisites to Pentecost accomplished? Do you even believe the words that Jesus has spoken in this book? I mentioned a few, but... There's a whole canon of scripture here. Are you not living of this world? Are you willing to be a witness for Christ? David Wilkerson said, when you strip it from everything else, Pentecost stands for power and life. And I think he's right. That is what came in the church when the Holy Spirit came down the day of Pentecost. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit who dwells in your hearts is life-changing. And then, as a result of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life, not only will it bring life to you, but it will bring life to those who you are witnessing to. Friends, I ask you tonight to make sure that you accomplish the prerequisites to Pentecost. Make sure you know the person of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. And then make sure that you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. The choice is really up to you. I can't make it for you. Pastor Stetler can't make it up for you. You have to make the decision for you. And the question is, will you follow the truth? that God is showing you tonight. I hope so. Stand together with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the reality of Acts chapter 1 and 2. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you have sent, the person of Pentecost. Thank you that we can believe what you say. Thank you that... We can be witnesses for you, but thank you that you can empower us to go into a sin-darkened world and bring others in to your sheepfold. And that we, as Christians, can live a life that is pleasing to you and becoming more and more like you. Would you help us to do this tonight? Would you help us to respond to this truth if we need to? In your name, amen. You're dismissed.